Welcome back to UC Davis Live COVID-19. I'm Satirius Johnson. In this week's show, we're talking about transmission. How does the COVID-19 virus spread? What can we do to stop it? And as we head into a holiday weekend, we'll be talking about what you can do to reduce the risk to you and your family. Here to help us get answers to those questions are Dr. Bill Ristenpart, Professor of Chemical Engineering at the UC Davis College of Engineering. He studies how droplets move and behave in liquids and gases, his lab at UC Davis. Uh, has studied how people emit small droplets or aerosols that could carry viruses while breathing or talking. Also, Dr. Dean Blumberg is a professor of uh, pediatrics and chief of pediatric infectious diseases at UC Davis Health. His interests are in preventing and treating childhood infections, as well as vaccine research and childhood immunization policies. Thanks so much to both of you for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. So we are taking audience questions. Uh, if you're watching us live, just leave them in the comments section and we will work in as many as we can. Uh, Dr. Blumberg, let's start with you. Since the beginning of the pandemic, uh, we've been told to stay home as much as possible, to keep six feet away from people and to wash our hands thoroughly and often. Early on, the advice for the general public was not to wear masks, but now we have a state mandate to wear masks. So how has our understanding of how this virus spreads changed? Dr. Blumberg, can you hear me? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, sorry. I had a little bit of connection issue. So I think what the issue with the masks is, um, you know, I'd like to restart, just like start over again with the masks because we've learned a lot regarding the masks. So initially we did not think that wearing a mask would help um, prevent transmission. Um, and then we shifted and said, wearing a mask helps uh, prevent transmission from the person wearing the mask to others. And now we've learned more due to, certain, due to research and uh, additional scientific evidence. And now we know not only wearing a mask prevents the person wearing the mask to transmit to others, but wearing the mask protects the person who's wearing it. So the wearer of the mask, even the standard rectangular um, uh, surgical masks, wearing those will decrease the risk of infection to the person wearing the mask by about 65%. And then wearing, of course, the N95 masks, the more cone-shaped ones, we've always known that those would protect. Those, of course, are in shortage and we're reserving those for, for healthcare workers. So we're not recommending that the general public um, wear those, but those work too. And then the big question is, what about the, the homemade masks? And what about them? Are they as effective or are they helpful at all? I've heard that bandanas are not so great. Well, the um, homemade mask, the, the surgical mask pr protects the person from who's wearing the mask from getting infected because this is protecting against droplet transmission. This is primarily transmitted by respiratory droplets. So it's a physical barrier. And so the other masks theoretically should work quite well, even the homemade mask, as long as they cover the nose and the mouth. So they should block those tr the droplets. The uh, question is about aerosol transmission and the, the, the rectangular homemade, mat, uh, the rectangular surgical mask, which don't provide an airtight seal, um, the aerosols can get around there. So the aerosols are much smaller um, particles and probably the homemade cloth masks don't block those either. How, how big a factor are people without symptoms in spreading the virus? Yeah, that's a good question. And we were not certain of the answer. Early on, the CDC did some excellent studies which showed that about 10 to 12% of cases were caused by people who were asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic, meaning they're not symptomatic today, but tomorrow or the next day, they might become symptomatic. Some other research that's more recent suggests that maybe 30% of infections are caused by people who are asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic. So it's very important to, uh, even if you're feeling well or you're around a group of people who apparently are not sick, it's, it's very important to be wearing those masks. Everyone should wear a mask if they're in a situation where they can't adequately social distance and especially if they're indoors. What do you think are the most important things people should bear in mind to stay healthy? So I think that being, what we found is being outdoors is very useful because outdoors there's such a large volume of air that it, it really um, dilutes the virus so much. So we believe that the majority of transmission that's taking place in the community is taking place indoors. And that's why we've seen 
um, with the contact tracing in California, um, initially what we were seeing is that we're, with relaxing of the social distancing, that people were visiting in each other's houses, families and friends, and that's where transmission was taking place. And then when restaurants and bars were opening up, of course, if you go to a bar, you're drinking, so you don't have your mask on when you're drinking. Um, that's not feasible, I guess maybe feasible if you use a straw, but that doesn't sound very pleasant. <laughs> um, and so, um, you know, the indoors in the bars, I think that's that was causing transmission also. So I think if people are going to socialize, doing it outdoors is a much safer environment to do to do that in. Um, and so I think those are the really the main things that people can do to protect themselves. Stay outdoors if you're going to socialize, maintain social distancing if you can, and then wear a mask. We have a question from uh, someone watching on Facebook. AJ is asking, what about the masks with one-way valves? How effective are they? Yeah, so the masks with one-way valves, those are designed for like construction work or industrial work where you want to be protected from particles like dust or something. So those work very well for the person wearing the mask, but the valve means that all that person is, is exhaling is unfiltered air. And so any of those masks with the valve will protect the person wearing the mask and will provide no protection to any contact that they're with. So I consider that um, useful for the person wearing the mask, but it's mm -hmm. very selfish. So it's not helping to prevent transmission in the community. It's kind of like going to the bathroom and not washing your hands. Mm -hmm. It doesn't protect anybody else. It's not hygienic. Right, okay. Uh, you know, we've been seeing more sectors of businesses opening up and, and some now are actually being ordered to close again because of a spike in cases. Uh, grocery stores have been open the whole time. In many places, we have dining restaurants back open, hairdressers, other retail stores, casinos. How can we make good decisions about what activities are actually safer and which are more risky? Um, what should we be thinking about as we kind of dip our toe into venturing back out into the world? Well, again, being outdoors is safer than indoors. So if you're going to go out to a restaurant, if they have a patio and the weather's nice, choose the patio, stay outdoors. That's going to dilute the virus from any contact. If you're inside at a grocery store, of course you have to go to a grocery store. You need to, that's a, that's a necessity. Um, but when you're walking by people very quickly, um, even if you can't maintain that six foot social distance, three feet is good. Three feet is better than zero feet. So try to make maintain as much social distance as you can. And if you're really going past somebody quickly, the chances of getting infected are quite low. It's really more lingering and talking with people. If you see people who aren't wearing a mask in an indoor environment, avoid them. So I would just take a large circle uh, uh, around them because not everybody is wearing a mask um, indoors. And the same thing with outdoors in environment. So I like to go to the farmer's market under the freeway on Sunday in Sacramento. That tends to be quite crowded where it's difficult to social distance and not everybody's wearing a mask. So I make sure that if there's a lot of people congregated who aren't wearing masks, I, I give them a, a wide berth. We have another mask question. Brent from Facebook is asking, is the 65% reduction in transmission from an individual to ourselves from wearing a standard surgical mask only true if maintaining six feet or greater distance? No, those studies, uh, the, the studies that I quoted from 65%, those are studies with healthcare workers and people in the community. So it doesn't account for social distancing. And we know that healthcare workers, of course, they're very close to, to patients. So right. no, the social distancing is a, that's a separate um, issue. Again, we are taking your questions. If you're watching us on the live stream and would like to ask a question, just drop it into the comment section and we will try to work it in. Uh, Dr. Ristenpart, as an engineer, uh, what got you interested in viruses? So that's a good question. Uh, I, you know, I'm, my area of expertise is in something called a complex transport phenomena. So it's thinking, for example, about how droplets evaporate. Um, and so I'd like to say that I, I agree with everything Dean just said. Um, in terms of um, minimizing transmission risk, there's uh, not only should you wear a mask and not only should you prioritize outdoor uh, situations, um, but for indoor situations where you do have some control, for example, over the ventilation rate, that's something you may want to think about. So there's a change, there's a phrase that engineers use called uh, air changes per hour. And that just is a measure of how quickly does all the air in an indoor environment get replaced. Typical residences are about three to four air changes per hour. Um, commercial uh, you know, kitchens have a higher uh, quantity. Parking garages have 12 air changes per hour because you have potential accumulation of carbon monoxide and things like that. So if you, for a lot of the listeners here, if you do have situations where you're inside and you do have to 
uh, interact with other people, something you can think about is opening the window, okay? Or you can just increase, if you can, control the um, ventilation rate in your room. You wanna have as much clean air as possible. That's a, that's a great idea. And just even, the, 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 are there studies showing like to, the differences in having an open window as opposed to a closed window or? Actually, yes, yeah. I mean, so there's something, there's a model, there's something called the classic Wells-Riley model for airborne disease transmission, which has this, this parameter, the air changes per hour as a key, um, as a key parameter. Um, and there have been studies where they looked at uh, transmission rates in hospitals and things like that, where they have simply just having the windows open versus the windows closed. And with the windows open, uh, the rate of transmission was lower um, mm. just because you have more fresh air, you're flushing that virus out. Right. And one of the things you study is aerosols. So why don't, can you uh, just briefly you know, define for us what, what are aerosols and how are they important for spreading viruses? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so Dean already um, uh, hinted at this. There's for airborne disease transmission, there's two kind of main modes. Uh, there's so-called droplet transmission and that's what everybody kind of has a sense for when you cough or you sneeze, you can see, you can see these droplets coming up. And the fact that you can see them means that they're above the uh, human limit of resolution for the eyes, which is about 30 microns in size. And so for contrast, a human hair is about hundred microns in diameter. So you can still see these droplets. And so the, the six foot rule that you've, everybody's heard about, um, a large uh, part of that, it's predicated on the idea of how far can these droplets go. They follow a ballistic trajectory before they hit the ground by gravity. It's very difficult for human lungs to propel droplets much further than about six feet. Um, and so it's, that's the droplet spray mode for airborne. The other mode is aerosol transmission. And so here, as I'm talking, or as when you're talking, you actually emit a tremendous number of one micron scale particles. So way smaller, you cannot see them by the naked eye. Okay. You need specialized equipment to detect them, but even though they're so small, they can and have been shown to carry respiratory viruses. Um, and so a lot of the outbreaks that have been, um, that have occurred, for example, that uh, kind of famous one that happened in the choir practice up in Washington state, uh, you know, there was one infected person, they shared an indoor space for two hours, they were already social distancing, but something like 53 out of 60 got infected from that one person just from singing. And so when you vocalize, you emit these micron scale particles. Most people don't think about it, but singing or talking actually do emit these particles that can be infectious and dangerous. Right, and especially singing or, or uh, you know, cheering on a sports team, you're actually projecting a lot more than just normal speech, right? Or, or going, going back to the bars. I mean, like usually in um, bars or other loud environments, you raise your voice, okay? You might talk closer to somebody. There's something called the Lombard effect, which I learned from one of our UC Davis colleagues in linguistics, where you tend to have longer, uh, you, you extend the duration of your vowels for clarity and you speak in a louder voice. Mm. Our research has shown very clearly that the louder you speak, the more expiratory aerosols that come out. So if you combine tight packing in a bar, no masks, very loud, you know, talking or singing karaoke, um, you're really maximizing the chances of transmission. So speaking of uh, aerosols and air exchange, uh, we have a question. Uh, Sagnik from Facebook is asking, is it safe to travel by flight now? Uh, while traveling, what sort of mask provides maximum safety and what other rules should be followed? Uh, so I'll, I'll take a stab at that. I, I've had some NIH support for the past few years. And one of the pictures we put in the grant proposal back in 2014 was a picture of a cross section of a airplane cabin showing the airflow there and like how it's, it's really um, important to understand the effect of the airflow on the airborne disease transmission. Um, in terms of masks, I think everything that Dean already said about the different types of masks applies on an airplane or anywhere else. Um, one thing to note about airplanes is that uh, the little overhead thing where the air is coming out, um, that's 50%, you, it's supposed to be 50% fresh air that's sucked in from outside and 50% HEPA filtered recycled air. So at least even before the pandemic, whenever I flew on a plane, I would always crank open that knob and like have fresh air flowing on my face. So I was breathing primarily fresh air rather than the air exhaled by people next to me. So that, that's probably what I would recommend on a flight. Like make sure you're wearing, wearing a surgical mask or, or better um, and have that fresh air aimed right at your face. We have another question from an audience member. AJ on Facebook is asking, maybe this one's good for you, uh, Dr. Blumberg. How long can the virus stay in the air in a confined room? Or either one of you, but. Yeah, I'll let um, Dr. Ristenpart start with okay. that one. Yeah, sure. So uh, there have been studies now uh, using uh, um, 
in, in laboratory conditions, looking at the viability, uh, whether or not the virus stays alive um, in aerosol form. Um, and the half-life, uh, which is a measure of how quickly the virus dies, uh, shows that it's on the scale of hours. So the virus doesn't, it persists in the air. Um, and so a typical, going back to this idea of air changes per hour, you know, even a poorly ventilated room will still have about three air changes per hour. So what that means is that really it's the ventilation rate, how quickly you flush out that air matters much more than the, how long it survives in the air. So mm -hmm. it'll stay alive longer um, than the rate of ventilation. So again, that, that drives that point home. Right. Linda, who's uh, watching on Facebook is asking, will air filters make a difference inside? Will air conditioners with good filters make a difference? So <clears throat> standard HVAC systems just have, uh, you know, regular, not very good filters. Right. Um, catch the big dust. Um, you, to really clean up the air, to get rid of these micron scale aerosols, you need HEPA filters. Um, and so that's um, something that I've installed in my HVAC system. It's not perfect. I do have um, kind of a quasi HEPA filter. You can also buy air purifiers that have like their little standalone units. Um, I've had that question a lot, you know, um, should I get one of those? And I, I think it can only help, you know, if you have one of those there, it's sucking the, the room air in, it removes these micron scale particles. It'll help decrease right. the concentration, decrease your chance of inhaling it and getting infected. So it couldn't hurt. It couldn't hurt. I'm not aware of any studies showing home, you know, purifiers decrease in transmission risk, but it seems very plausible to me. Uh, let's see, we have another question. Uh, Michelle, who's watching on Facebook is asking, and this is probably a good one for you, Dr. Blumberg. How does this differ from viruses such as the flu in which the more mild exposure builds antibodies? It seems like having everyone protect themselves from any exposure is actually causing the virus to stay around longer and be more harmful. Yeah, well, you know, we, we have a lot of questions about, about immunity after infection, and we just don't know. So we don't know that if you're infected with um, this coronavirus, if you're protected, we don't know how long you're protected for. Are you protected for weeks, for months, for a couple of years? We're not sure. We think based on experience with similar coronaviruses that you're probably going to be protected for a year or two. But the idea behind all the measures that are being taken place, the social distancing, the recommendations to wear masks, the idea behind this is if everybody gets sick at once in a community, then that's gonna overwhelm healthcare systems. And that's what we don't want. And we saw that in New York City, in Italy, in Iran. Um, we saw that several places around the world where there weren't enough hospital beds, not enough ICU beds or ventilators to treat patients. And that's a disaster. So we wanna make sure that even though we know we're not gonna eliminate the virus with these measures, we do wanna limit transmission. We do wanna limit the number of patients who are admitted to the hospital at any one time so that we have the capacity to take care of everybody who needs to be taken care of. I mean, so this idea of, you know, when people say, well, I'm not gonna wear a mask because, you know, we'll just get herd immunity. Um, you're saying, you know, we're gonna overwhelm the healthcare system if we, all get sick at once. You know, we'll, we'll get to herd immunity, but the casualties will be enormous. Right. So right now in California, um, probably about 5% or so of the population has been infected. To get herd immunity, you need, you're going to need somewhere like 70 to 90% of the population to, um, to be immune. And so we're not going to get there for a long time. And if we get there all at once, it'll be a disaster with mass deaths. So, so, so the, you have to run the numbers and it just doesn't make sense to, for people to get sick now or people to want to get sick. And I've heard people say, I want to get it over with. Well, you know, no, no, it'd be better if you just didn't get it right now until we get some measures in place. Um, like, for example, if we had a vaccine that induced immunity, you know, hopefully in the next year or two, we'll have that available and, and then we can get high levels of population and immunity safely. Uh, Susie on Facebook is asking, what's the difference in protection between wearing a mask without social distancing and wearing a mask with so social distancing? Do we have any data on the difference? You know, I have not run the numbers, but there are studies that show that social distancing in and of itself 
decreases risk of transmission by more than 90%. So, so being six feet away from somebody decreases risk more than 90%. And then we also know that wearing a mask decreases risk by about two thirds or 65% or so. So you can see that, that doing both of those at the same time will really decrease your risk of infection to much less than 10%. If I could jump in with a, uh, sure. I, I agree with what Dean just said 100%, um, but I think it's really important for listeners to understand that just because you're standing six feet away from somebody or seven feet away, if you have a very prolonged conversation, um, you know, that's still a risk factor. So it's because these aerosol particles, they just travel along on very, very weak air currents. So it's, it's very, like, that's how all those people at the choir practice presumably got infected. They weren't within six feet of each other. They, they sang, they vocalized the air currents in the room just carried it to the far corners and infected 90% of the people in the room. We have another audience question. Hossein on Facebook is asking, is virus transmission limited to aerosol form rather than from contact on surfaces? Is it known how much sun exposure inactivates the virus? So I, I, I guess I'll take a stab at that. My understanding uh, is that we don't have any direct evidence of which form of, of transmission uh, is most predominant. Um, you know, for ethical reasons, we can't go and contaminate a bunch of people's hands and then have them touch their faces or other people's faces, um, or line a bunch of people up and have them cough in somebody else's face and then measure the transmission rate. We just can't do that. So we have to back out what the probable form of transmission was indirectly, you know, post facto after the event. And so that's why events like that choir practice are, are very convincing because they all reported that it was after social distancing was implemented. They weren't didn't shake hands and things like that. Yet they still all got infected. Um, and so how else could it happen? Presumably it was aerosol mm. transmission. Having said that, it would be a bad idea to stop washing your hands. It would be a bad idea to start saying like, oh, it's okay if I'm, you know, it's always outside of six feet. I mean, like we need to take, uh, implement all these different measures um, to really reduce the risk of transmission. Yeah, and if I could just jump in here, I just, you know, this is, we know from other coronaviruses, this is primarily a respiratory transmitted illness. And so we, we, we know that. And so that's the main issue is really to avoid respiratory transmission. But washing hands is good. And theoretically, a small percentage of cases might be transmitted um, via, via touching contaminated surfaces. We have another question. Uh, Margie, who's watching on Facebook, is asking, do we still need to be so fastidious with cleaning groceries and mail? Yeah, and, and, and again, I, I think that that's probably not where I would recommend um, our, our efforts. I think it, the major effort should be in social distancing, wearing masks, and being outdoors. Those are much more important. And I think there's a very small percentage of chance of transmission via fomites such as groceries or mail or other things. And so that's not an area that I focus on. I think people are just anxious. They just want to know, you know, when you have your guard up so long. So like, okay, just to sum up kind of like the hierarchy of, of risk would be the most, the highest and most uh, threatening risk would be uh, being close to somebody who has the virus, right? Because of the mm -hmm. respiratory transmission. And then the second one after that would be surfaces. Is that, would that be safe to say? Yeah, well, I like to say, you know, do the social distancing, wear a mask, do stuff outdoors, wash your hands. That's always good. And then all the other stuff is like a, a small percent. Right. Yeah, I suspect a lot of viewers might be confused because the early on the advice was like, wash your hands, you don't need masks. But more and more data came in, more evidence came in and became more and more clear that uh, the aerosol transmission was playing a bigger role. And right. so that's, that's why the emphasis is switched. So, uh, Bill, I mean, I, I understand that you've all you've also been working on how viruses can spread on things like dust particles. Can they? And and if if they can, does that mean viruses can stay aloft in the air longer than with an aerosol or something like that? So, my colleagues and I have been working on influenza virus for the past few years, and so we do have some data in the context of dust particulates. Um, that's uh, I'm not aware of any work on uh, SARS-CoV-2 in that regard. Um, there was one study published in Nature uh, last month showing that uh, some of the highest airborne viral counts in some hospitals in China were actually not where the patients were, but in the rooms where the healthcare workers were doffing their, their PPE, taking off their gowns, taking off their masks. Um, so th there's, that suggests, it doesn't confirm, but it suggests that maybe, maybe virus is being aerosolized from clothing 
um, from heavily contaminated clothing. You know, there are healthcare workers working with patients all day long. Um, so there could be some chance of that, uh, but more research is needed to corroborate that possibility. Okay. We have a, que a question from Christine watching on Facebook. If you work in an office cubicle next to other occupied cubicles, do the cubicle walls protect you from transmission if your cubicle neighbors are not wearing masks? So well, I think we've all gone into grocery stores and other situations where we've seen the plexiglass that's been um, between the customer and the cashier. So I think that does provide some degree of protection um, against droplet transmission, but it's not going to protect against the aerosol um, transmission. Um, so I think that's the, the key with that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the, <clears throat> the, those sneeze guards and whatnot will block large droplets that you can see. But uh, I think a, a useful way to think about it is smells. You know, like if, if the person on the other side of the plexiglass is wearing a perfume, you know, they don't need to breathe the perfume on you. It just travels through the air and then you, eventually it hits your nose and you smell it. Um, so they're on the other side of that plexiglass exhaling or talking. They're emitting these aerosol particles. They're small enough to travel on the air, much like an aroma. And so they can just whoop, scoot around that, the plexiglass and then you breathe it. Right. So, so a regular cubicle without plexiglass is probably not really great protection if you're closer than six feet. It, well, not wearing a mask. It, I, I would not depend on a cubicle wall to prevent it, but like the airflow situation matters there a lot. If you happen right, to be right. in a well, cubicle we, with that. We are, we are quickly running out of time. So I, I we do have a few more questions I wanna, I wanna ask you folks. So um, we're heading into a holiday weekend. You know, July 4th is right around the corner. Usually people would be out having cookouts and family parties. Do each of you have any advice for how to do that safely? Is it possible? Well, I'll go first with this and I, I'd say be outside. Again, outside is safer than inside. And if you can walk to where you're going, like it's a neighbor's in their backyard, that's safer because you don't wanna have to go inside somewhere else to go to the restroom. So um, stay outside, try to maintain that social distancing. I've seen a lot of issues related to bring your own food. I, you know, personally, I think it's, it's not transmitted by food. I think it's fine to share food when you touch utensils that are serving utensils. You know, use your alcohol hand gel before you eat, after you touch common things. That just make, that's just common sense um, to me. And then avoid large crowds and wear masks if you can't maintain that um, six foot social distance. I know uh, we've seen on the news and uh, in elsewhere in some places around the country, you know, we're seeing people who are resistant to wearing masks. They even get angry over it. Um, what would you say to some of those people? I, I, I just think they're ignoring scientific evidence. It's like saying, I don't believe in, if they don't believe in mass, it's not a belief system. It's saying like, I don't believe in gravity or something like that. I mean, you cannot believe in it, but it's just a fact. So it's a fact that wearing a mask protects yourself and protects others. So I think you're being an irresponsible member of the community if you're not wearing a mask. It's just like not washing your hands after going to the bathroom. It's like double dipping into the guacamole. It's not being very nice to others. Is it safe to say that um, people who don't you know, wear a mask, are they also possibly just extending the, the suffering for everyone? I think what they're doing is they're, people who don't wear a mask are increasing the risk for transmission for everybody. And it's not just the people who they come into contact with, but it's the subsequent people that their contacts come into contact with. So for example, I'm worried about my 96 year old mother-in-law who lives in an, ex an extended care facility. And um, I'm worried that if one of the workers in that facility gets sick from the community from not wearing a mask and comes in there, she's gonna get it and she's at high risk for complications. So it's, it affects all of us, not just the, their immediate family, not just their friends, but it affects everybody in the community. Okay, and just to wrap up, if, uh, if we can, Dr. Blumberg, what's the latest knowledge about children and the virus? Are children less susceptible to infection or do they just experience milder symptoms? I mean, do they spread the disease less than adults? What do we, what's the latest on what we know about that? Yes, yes, and yes. So children are less likely to be infected when they're exposed, about half as likely to be ex infected if they're exposed. They're less likely to be symptomatic if they are infected. If they do get infected, 
then they um, are less likely to have severe disease and they appear to be less likely to transmit to others also. So this is different than other infectious diseases. So for example, we know that children are primary factor of driving infections in the community for influenza or for, hep for hepatitis A. And we know that vaccination against those diseases can prevent, can prevent infection not only in children, but in adults who aren't immunized. Um, but with this, this novel coronavirus, this appears to be much more of uh, an adult issue. Well, it's very promising, but it's also important to uh, still keep our guard up, right? Yes, it's, a, it's still, you know, children can still get sick, a smaller percentage than adults, but they can still get sick and they could still transmit to others. So we do want children to be as hygienic as their developmental stage allows, yes. All right, well, thank you so much. This has been really great. Thank you for your time and for all the important work you're doing, both of you. Great, thank you. Dr. Dean Blumberg is a professor of pediatrics and chief of pediatric infectious diseases at UC Davis Health. Dr. Bill Ristenpart is a professor of chemical engineering at the UC Davis College of engineering. Every other week, we're hearing from researchers from across the UC Davis campuses who are working on vaccines, therapies, medical devices, tracking the virus, and looking for solutions in unexpected places. On the next UC Davis Live COVID-19, we'll be looking into COVID-19 indoors. How will the pandemic affect our buildings? Until next time, I'm Soterios Johnson, and this is UC Davis Live COVID-19.